Who knows how this thing all plays out, but I know it's fun talking about it. It's fun, Phil, trying to figure it out. I don't. I think if you asked 10 different guys who cover this team, 10 of you might have 10 different blueprints of where this thing might end up. But i got to ask you, other than the lockout season, has this been the most bizarre offseason possibly you've ever seen? Uh, it's up there. Um, you know, I remember back when uh, Reggie White was suing the team and we were going to courthouses and stuff. That was pretty weird. But, uh, you know, for the team to actually just sort of be going about its business, uh, that, that this is about as uh, unusual and un- <laughs> unexpected and unanticipatable. <laughs> not even just unanticipated. You could not – we didn't just not anticipate this. We could not possibly have anticipated this. So this is bizarre. I mean, you know, the entire uh, you know, starting offense, all the skill position guys are gone. I mean, it's a completely new team, basically. You know, let's start at the top here with the most important position at quarterback. A lot of people don't know what to make of the Sam Bradford. Chip Kelly finally spoke today a little bit about it. Did he make you feel any way, one way or another, about how he feels about his quarterback position now? Does he still have his eye on Mariota? Or do you believe that Sam Bradford will take the first snap in Philly in 2015? Uh, that's what I believe now, yes, I do. I think um, in the last night as it was breaking and things were kind of coming together, um, my first thought was this had to be part of something, uh, you know, down the line. This had to be a move that you made and then made, you know, flip Bradford or flip draft picks or whatever, whatever it was to get to Mariota. Um, it just seemed like that just made so much sense, and we, we've all been talking about it for so long. It seemed like it was finally in play. But when I saw the actual draft picks, and that the Eagles were the ones giving up a second round pick uh, from ne- for next year as part of this deal. Um, and then, you know, the kind of the reading between the lines of everything, I really started to sink in that this this is probably probably the move. And hearing the talk today, either Kelly was doing the greatest job <laughs> of, of throwing a smoke screen that anybody's ever done in the NFL. And that's possible. Uh, anything's possible, I guess, at this point. But uh, he sure sounded like a guy that was pretty excited to have Sam Bradford. Um, you know, running his offense. I mean, Sam Bradford is a is a fascinating character. He was the number one pick in the draft five years ago. Um, he, he should be right in the prime of his career. He's had the, the knee injuries. He's, you know, he's been, uh, you know, not not as good as you would have expected. Not playing on a great team, by the way. I mean, that was part of the problem there. Didn't have the weapons around him, and that has something to do with all this. But uh, you know, this is a guy that you know was an Andrew, you know. Andrew Luck is the first pick in the draft and the kind of guy with that kind of skill set. He might not be as good as Andrew Luck, but he's that neighborhood, uh, or who's expected to be in that neighborhood. Uh, if you believe you got an Andrew Luck type guy, then I can understand it. Uh, it's just that with the injuries and everything else, it's just hard to see that if you're not you know, watching film with Chip Kelly, I guess. Yeah, so many people have in their mind what the right fit of quarterback is for Philadelphia. You know, it had to be Mariota. The guy had to be able to run. In the end, was it that he couldn't get Mariota? Did he not believe he could get Mariota? Or does he really like Bradford more? Well, I think it was a, it's a combination of things. I think he, it's not so much he doesn't like Mariota or doesn't, doesn't believe he can get him. He just he said today, basically, you know, philosophically, I don't believe that you mortgage your entire future. And, you know, he, he was making the argument that the anti-Mariota people were making. Don't give up too much because then you don't have anything to put around him. you got other holes to fill. You need to use those draft picks for that. Um, you know, trading up and giving up the, the you know mortgage in the future basically is a mistake, and that's just a philosophical belief that he had. And so he made a very very convincing case not to do that kind of thing. And given that, if you believe that that you know uh, three number ones or you know two number ones and two number two was going to be too much to give up for Mariota, and they were not really ever considering that, then you look around and wait, what else you can do. And in that sense, that you know, maybe Bradford was the best player that they could get. Uh, you know, maybe Sam Bradford projects better to them than, you know, Bryce Petty or somebody in the draft. So, um, you know, right now my assumption is that the Mariota thing is not going to happen. It's the first time I really believe that, uh, you know, since all this all started. I really thought that had to be the, the end game. But, uh, like I said, these are the greatest smoke screen of all time or uh, Chip pretty, pretty much convinced me. Phil Sheridan's with us, ESPN.com's NFL Nation, at Sheridan Scribe on Twitter. So many moves to go down. But let, let me ask you about Bradford real fast in terms of Foles. Do you think this was a mistake? Do you think they gave up too much? Is there a significant upgrade 
this is a big money thing. This isn't uh, just two guys swip, flip-flopping salaries. This is a significant bump in pay. So do you think the Eagles gave up too much? Was Bradford a significant upgrade over Foles? Well, that's the big question. and I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I've seen Bradford play on TV a couple of times. But that's about it. I don't have that much of a you know, working knowledge of the, of the kid. Um, you know, when Chip was talking about Bradford, he said, you know, he's a big guy, he's physical, you know, he's a, you know, he's all, and he, he sounded like he was describing Nick Foles to me. I mean, that's, you know, Nick's a really good sized quarterback. He's actually probably a little bigger than Bradford. You know, he's, he played basketball. He's got a little bit of, you know, he's got some athletic ability. I mean, he's not a, not a great, not a great speedster or a runner, Nick Foles. We, we've seen that, but, you know, I think that if they're right about Bradford here and they're seeing something that he does well, He's a quick decision maker. He's got a good arm. He does all that stuff really well. If they believe that they can get that stuff on track in this offense, and he'll be more, you know, efficient and and make better decisions and better throws than Foles can make, I understand that appeal. However, you know, in the NFL, if Sam Bradford hasn't had anything like Nick Foles' 2013 season, if Bradford has the first pick in the 2010 draft had a second season like Foles had in 2013, 27 touchdowns and two interceptions and all that stuff. If he'd done that, everybody would be saying, well, they'd be talking about him like he was Andrew Luck or better than Andrew Luck. So Foles did that. And, you know, he Foles did that as a, as a third-round pick that nobody talks about or seems to care about. But uh, he's a big guy. He did all that. Uh, he played, you know, he won six games in eight starts this year playing behind a, a, a decimated offensive line, just a ruined offensive line. Um, there's a lot of good things about Nick Foles. Um, I haven't seen Bradford do that. Nobody's seen him do it in the NFL, certainly. Um, I didn't see him much in college, so obviously he was that guy in college, but it's, it's been now six years since his, his college his college career ended, so right. you know that, that's a long way to go without really having a good season. Well, one question that we've kind of been kicking around here, Phil, you know, Systems. That word has come up so much recently in the NFL. Is it the right fit, the right system? And realistically, if Nick Foles started his career in St. Louis and Sam Bradford started his career playing for Chip Kelly, would we know who Nick Foles is? I mean, is he a guy that you think can go to St. Louis and make them go from 7-9 and nine to 10-6? and six? Can he elevate a team to a playoff level? Because that team is playing in a tough division with some tough defenses. He's not going to have a lot of weapons. You just talked about the line. I'm afraid this guy's going to go out there and completely, you know, show what some people believe is his true colors. Yeah, well, that, that's very possible. In fact, that's probably likely, given what the Rams do have and, as you mentioned, the division they play in. We saw Foles pretty much play that division uh, in, in 2014. You know, the Eagles played at Arizona, and the Eagles played at San Francisco. And uh, he didn't play against Seattle, uh, Sanchez did, but, you know, those are pretty good defenses, and Foles didn't exactly, you know, have his best games <laughs> against uh, against those teams. So, um, yeah, it's very possible that it's bad for him there, uh, especially given what's around him in, in St. Louis. Uh, and I would feel bad for Nick in that, in that sense, although in, in, in a way that actually helps the Eagles. I mean, the Eagles look better if Foles never – you know, if Foles doesn't win the Super Bowl with Jeff Fisher as his coach – you know, the Eagles are going to look pretty bad. <laughs> well, I mean, uh, realistically, like, is hey, look, Nick put up some great numbers a couple of years ago. We, it was an amazing year. But do you think that this system makes their numbers look and makes these players look better than they are, Macklin included? Macklin was never a 1,000-yard guy. All of a sudden, he's a 1,300-yard guy making 11 million bucks. Good receiver, is he a $11 million a year wide receiver, or does this system inflate your numbers to the point where people think you might be a better player than you actually are? Yeah, there's definitely an element of that here. I mean, Mark Sanchez was never a 60% passer uh, before either, and you know he set the franchise record for you know, passing accuracy in 2014. He won four games and lost four games, but the numbers look very good, and you know, uh, Macklin's an excellent example of that too. I, I was surprised. I mean, I've never been a big Macklin fan over the years. I kind of thought he was, he seemed like too ready to to take the excuse that well, it's just Sean Jackson's job to be the number one guy. I'm just the number two guy. And he seemed very comfortable in that role, and I didn't, didn't really see him, you know, 
expecting or demanding more from himself. Uh, but last year, you know, he came off the ACL and he had a great year. But you know, as you said, this offense may have been a, a big part of that. Um, obviously, he can do it if he did it. But uh, the offense certainly does a certain amount of this. And I think that's a little bit of what Kelly is doing here. Um, you know, when he moves uh, LaShawn McCoy and says, all right, you know, that money is going to go somewhere else. Uh, I can do – I can get a running back for less money and get that kind of production. That's what he's saying. He believes that the system is going to produce um, great numbers in the running backs and the wide receivers. You don't necessarily have to have or pay a top-dollar guy. Um, that's the decision they made with McCoy. Um, they were only going so high for Macklin. Uh, when Kansas City went above that level, he was gone. Um, that's a big part of this. And, yeah, especially with quarterbacks, I think like if your skill set fits, Kelly can certainly find a way to get the most out of you. Yeah, in the end, it just seems that he believes that Bradford's just a better player than Foles is. Yeah, absolutely. No, that was definitely that was definitely the uh, – he didn't say those words, but that was the message, um, that they believe that, that Bradford can be, and in the system, be – you know, an elite quarterback or closer to an elite quarterback than Foles could be. And that, that's, you know, getting Mariota, we, you know, anytime you, you go up in the draft like that, there's a risk. I mean, you know, Bradford himself is an example of what happens when you have the number one pick in the draft. Robert Griffin III is what happens when a guy gets hurt and you're not sure if you're fixing your system or whatever. I mean, when you make a move to get a guy high in the draft, you know, that's a big risk. This is a, you know, this is a risk. I mean, you're getting rid of Nick Foles. There's a second-round pick involved. But in terms of, you know, of that kind of a move for a quarterback, it's not as big a risk as, uh, you know, trading your entire draft to get up to get it, get a guy like Griffin or something like that. So, uh, clearly, you know, they value the position of quarterback. Kelly believes the system can get the most out of guys, and they believe this guy can be uh, – uh, you know, closer to a Super Bowl caliber guy than Nick Foles could be. It's almost as if he valued Sanchez more than Foles too. Like I'd rather have you back as the backup, and maybe Foles had more value, I guess, than Sanchez did. But I guess he's figured I'd rather have him be here than than Foles. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that, but it's it seems odd that they paid him for those two years that kind of money when they maybe could have just given that money for Foles and said, "Look, we're going to put you in a competition." Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, Kelly really seems to like Sanchez a lot. And uh, he talked him up quite a bit during the season. And, uh, you know, there were some reports and, 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 it, and he, some indications that you could just sort of see that, you know, Foles wasn't exactly you know, wowing them, um, you know, the coaching staff. And, you know, you don't know what goes on in the meetings and what, when they're talking about and closed doors. I don't know what the problems there might have been. You know, it seemed to me that when the offensive line went bad, you know, Foles' play went bad. I mean, that seemed pretty cut and dry from the outside. But I don't know if there was something going on in, internally that wasn't working that, that well for them. Uh, but Kelly really seemed to love Sanchez and see him as a guy, you know, where, where the other thing is that Foles would not have been happy just to come in and say, right, you're going to be the backup. Sanchez, he gets that. If, if they bring Sam Bradford in here and Sanchez is number two, uh, but with Sam Bradford, you got a good chance your number, your number two is going to play some. Uh, you know, there's not any any uh, animosity there. He's just going to be content to be the number two if he's the number two and ready to play if he's going to have to play. And that's, that's what they're looking for there. We're talking with Phil Sheridan, ESPN.com's NFL Nation. Um, we asked if Bradford is a significant upgrade over Foles. Is Byron Maxwell a significant upgrade over Kerry Williams, or are they more similar than people might think? Yeah, I think they are quite similar. And, uh, you know, it's it's really telling that the Seattle Seahawks plugged their hole by losing of, of losing Byron Maxwell by signing Kerry Williams. I mean that's how almost funny the way that turned out. And it'll be interesting to watch because Kerry Williams played cornerback for the team that won the Super Bowl, you know, a few months before he signed with the Eagles. So it's not like Kerry Williams can't play the game. He's got some ability and he's got some uh he's got some something of a resume. Um you know I, I go back to the Patrick Chung thing. The Eagles signed Patrick Chung as a safety the same time they signed Kerry Williams and Bradley Fletcher. And nobody in Philadelphia is happy with Bradley Fletcher, Kerry Williams, or Patrick Chung, who barely made a, a ripple here and was released last year. But then he gets back to New England, starts, wins the Super Bowl, gets a contract extension because he's playing in the right system with good coaching. And it's really important that the Eagles have changed their uh, defensive backs coaches. Uh, they hired
hired Corey Unlin, who was the Broncos defensive back coach uh, out there. Um, that's really important, too. It's, uh, it's, it's a clear message there that whatever was going on, it wasn't just the players. So, you know, um, you know Maxwell only started 17 games in the NFL uh, while he was with the Seattle Seahawks. Um, you know, based on that, to give him $63 million over six years, and that, that's a huge leap of faith. Um, you know, he, you know, he may be the kind of guy that you, you find out, hey, he's really working. You know, he really he plays hard. He, you know, he's competitive. He's competitive. He, he does what it takes to win. But you know, they don't know that much about him yet. And uh, until they do, um, you know, I, I guess the best way to put it is, I won't be shocked if next year we're talking about Maxwell the same way we were talking about the guys that were playing yeah. in the secondary here last year. That that would be a bad thing for the Eagles, obviously. But there is a real risk there. Yeah, we talked about this yesterday, Phil. He had nine penalties in just 13 games. The problem with a lot of fans on Williams was the penalties. He had seven in 16 games. So Maxwell brings a lot of penalties, aggressive play with him here. We're talking with Phil Sheridan, ESPN.com, NFL Nation, who covers the Eagles. A couple other minor moves, but the big one was Macklin walking. So what's next at wide receiver for Philadelphia? Are there options that are attractive, or is this something that they really – you know, got caught, uh, you know, taking a nap at the wheel here. I think they really were kind of counting on him coming back, and they thought they were offering enough. And uh, there's not much you can do when a team decides to overpay a little bit. And, and as we just talked about, I, you know, Macklin, I was impressed by Macklin this past year. I had not been that big a fan of him before that. Um, I wondered about the Eagles going up to $10 million or $11 million a year for a guy uh, who might, you know, kind of end – kind of re- revert back to what he had been before. There's a real risk there. Um, the trouble is, you know, when you whack the Sean Jackson one year and Jeremy Macklin walks away the next year, you know, those are two first-round picks who played the same position and uh, were successful players in the NFL. I mean, both in the prime of their careers. When you lose two guys like that, those are resources. They, they're, you know, you can't just plug a hole and, uh, you know, fill them that easily. Um, you know, the draft is supposed to be pretty – pretty deep in wide receivers this year. Uh, you know, the fact that they're signing cornerbacks, um, you know, they still need a safety, but uh, if the Mariota thing's off the table, that 20th pick becomes, you know, quite possibly the best receiver uh, or, or running back available. And if you get somebody there, and then Jordan Matthews, and if Josh Huff can take another another step up, you know, then you got the, you got the guy something there. You got the framework. But because uh, I'm not sure there's a whole lot of guys in free agency right now that would be worth that kind of money either. A lot of people uh, aren't sure what to make of what Chip's doing. They don't know what the plan is. But I'll ask you, Phil, if you like the plan. Do you understand and do you like what he's doing and what he's done this off season? Um, uh, you know, I have mixed emotions about it. I mean, I think he helped himself by coming out talking today. Uh, I do find that you know. When, when people explain what they're doing and, they, and you can kind of get a feel for it, you can, you can sense their enthusiasm about it. And it really does help to kind of sell you a little bit. Um, you know, I, I still think, that, you know, they clearly they spent a lot of money on Maxwell, as we just talked about. That might have been too much. Um, they didn't get Devin McCourty, and that was obviously part of the plan as well. Uh, clearly the plan included, you know, trying to get Devin McCourty and keeping Jeremy Macklin. So, you know, those three big free agents, and then Frank Gore was in there too. So there's three of the four guys that they targeted on day one that uh, they didn't get. And um, so that would, you know, that's not exactly a, a grand slam there. That's a, that's a fun single, basically, if anything. So good. I mean, you know, good news in some ways. Um, some of them seem like backup plans. Uh, Ryan Matthews seems like a backup plan uh, if, that's, if that deal's done. So, you know, I, I guess I would have I would have liked to see the team that they had uh, play a healthy full 2014. I mean, I think if the offensive line hadn't gotten so banged up, um, you know, McCoy would have had a better year. Foles might have had a better year. Maybe he wouldn't have gotten hurt. Um, maybe those guys would have done better this year than win 10 games as they did. Um, it would have been interesting to see that group going into the third year. Definitely not the factor in here is you got – you know, not only are you talking about these different pieces, but these guys haven't all played together yet. I mean, you know, they haven't played in this offense yet. You have a bunch of guys who got to learn a new offense. You're kind of back to year one with the Eagles. Uh, you know, they had some success, but 
you know, you don't know how it's all going to turn out with all new guys playing new positions and everything. So, you know, it's uh, it's interesting. Uh, it's definitely not boring, but um, I guess we'll see how it turns out. But I do have some doubts about some of it. All right, uh, ESPN.com's NFL Nation. Phil Sheridan here, Chip Kelly continuing to make moves, and he'll possibly, you're going to get a chance to speak to him again at 415 here? I don't think so. I think that was probably it for uh, for Chip for now, but uh, <laughs> who knows? Who knows? It's first they announced the Ryan Matthews thing, he might come out, because he was asked about Ryan Matthews, and he said he couldn't talk about anybody you know, who was just visiting or hadn't signed or anything, but if they announce it and it's done, uh, and we're all here, you know, maybe he'll come out again. Who knows? All right, uh, so he's got a couple more press conferences today. We'll see if Chip appears. Phil Sheridan will be there. Thanks, Phil. Yeah, my pleasure. Take care. You got it.